Good afternoon, all. This is Amandi, your moderator for the day, and I lead the industry initiative at NASCOM Pune. I, along with my team, welcome you all. Our today's session is the first in design thinking series, where we will be talking about more on amplifying design ops to maturity. Design is seen as the core capability of mature digital product companies. The depth and breadth of design, team sizes, workload, and complexities is on the rise. And so is the responsibility to make it run effectively. With this session, we intend to touch upon why and when one needs to think about design ops, what are the critical elements, how these pieces interlink, what does it take to operationalize design, and where can one start, along with a few industry case studies. Please join me in welcoming the industry experts and our speakers for the day who will be sharing their insights on this aspect of design maturity. We have with us Mr. Sneen Shabosquire, the founder and CEO at Use Designs, and Prasad Bertake, co-founder and chief of design and research at Use Designs. Both come with more than two decades of experience in managing multidisciplinary and global UX team. As the leaders behind the growth of Use Designs, they have made a name for it as a top tier UX design studio in India. With a rock solid experience of working on more than 2000 design and research projects, they have earned a spot in the top 15 global user experience agencies and has successfully crafted experiences for more than 100 international clients, many of them Fortune 500 company. Thank you so much, Prasad and Use Design team for joining us today. Yeah, now we thanks, Amandeep. Yes, now we will yeah. start with webinar. I hope you're all able to hear me. In case you're not able to hear us or view the presentation when it is being shared, please raise your hands. There's an option available at your end. Also, as we start on presenting, you might have some queries. Keep on posting them on the question panel indicated by a question mark. We will be addressing all the queries at the end of the webinar. We request you to be as descriptive as possible. This makes it easier for the moderation team to ensure that your queries are answered. Also, as most of us are currently on work from home, there might be some lag in voice or data. So request you to kindly bear with us. I would now give you presentation rights to you, Prasad, and request you take it ahead from here. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, well, I hope uh, everyone is um, able to see the screen. Uh, welcome all the attendees. Uh, thanks for taking out time for the session. Hope um, you will be able to benefit out of this. Keep your questions coming because that's how it helps us all grow. Uh, so I'll let Samir drive the initial few slides here. Um, so over to you, Samir, and then we will uh, proceed. Okay, great. Uh, <clears throat> I see a lot of people still joining in. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, and today's topic is um, taking my design operations to maturity. And we have said my design operations on purpose because there is no right time to start design operations. It's always the right time, you can say. Um, because design is fundamentally becoming so important these days that whatever your customers or whatever your end users see, or feel or experience is the design and nothing else, right? So we've divided this into <clears throat> two parts today. If you can go ahead, Prasad. Yeah. Yeah, uh, the topic is what does it take to operationalize design? And uh, you know, this is divided into two parts. We'll first talk about what is the maturity of the company who should start design operations, uh, what investments are being made by very large design organizations, how they are benefiting, um, and then when do you really start design ops? Uh, then we'll get into the second part, what is design ops? What are the different elements of design ops? How does it work? Uh, how does it work and benefits and conclusions, okay? So, <clears throat> In terms of you know design maturity, if you can go to the next slide, Prasad. Um, there is this diagram that you can see. I'm sure all of you can see this. Uh, and this is a typical journey that uh, a lot of companies uh, are going through uh, for design maturity. And this I've seen over 20 years of experience. 
uh, whether it's India or US or Europe, anywhere. And the typical start is, you know, you are UX unaware, very initially, as a company. And it could be any company. It could be a startup. It could be, a, you know, a early growth company, a mature company as well. And there is some kind of trigger that lets you think about design, right? And that awareness or the trigger is created through either a customer complaint or a failed product or somebody taking initiative or a competitor, you know, kind of getting advantages of you. And then the company typically looks for outside help because to uh, be very competitive in this particular market, uh, you'll need to have very focused design help from people who are uh, mature in design and who are experts. Um, and then they kind of go to hire, you know, in-house designers or work with freelancers. And if that works very well, then, you know, the dotted line that you see takes that company towards design maturity, right? Typically, if that fails, after one or two years, if you are disappointed with the result, um, but the problem still remains that your product needs design and product needs experience right you continue to work with freelancers or hire from outside and at a certain point you know they lose hope because design operations is not being thought through right this is where it's very important for all organizations to think about design operations it starts by you know hiring designers but that's extremely important and then there is a curve towards UX maturity, right? And any organization can uh, actually look at this particular curve and see where they stand to assess themselves on design operations and design maturity. If you go to the next slide, Prasad, uh, this is a typical uh, user experience maturity model. Um, it's still painting right now. Uh, from unrecognized to institutionalized. And many of these companies that you see and you recognize their logos, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, Honeywell, um, SAP, IBM, all of them have started much earlier their own design journey, right? And if you look at this particular UX maturity model, a study that was done with 408 different companies found that the more a company invested in and focused on design, the more sales they saw. They saw higher customer retention and customer engagement. And the faster they moved through the product cycle. So this is simply because they kept UX design and more importantly, the user at the very core of their business. Now, certain examples that you see here on this particular slide, I don't have to really explain what these companies do, but you can see how successful these companies really are right now. So in terms of the UX maturity, if you go to the next slide, um, and I have kind of um, uh, enumerated here, a startup, early growth, high growth, and mature company, the sooner you invest, the more money, time, reputation, customers you will save and be leaders in this market. So let's look at some of the business implications of what does it mean to be design focused first? And so there's this very interesting example. Um, there's this DMI, which is called the Design Management Institute, which is an international membership uh, that connects designers to business. Uh, so they are a conglomerate of researchers, designers, leaders from very different organizations. And these guys have been creating something called a design value index. So the companies that you see, uh, the design conscious companies listed here, Apple, um, Coca-Cola, Ford, Herman Miller, IBM, Intuit, these guys are tracking these all these companies for a very long period of time. And the graph that you okay. see on the left-hand side is from 04, that is 2004 to 2014, and they have tracked the value that these design conscious companies are creating. And you can see the huge gap between S&P 500 index and the index of these design conscious companies. 
and for those who don't know what snp is it's almost like our 10 seconds nac and you know bac right and these companies were selected based on um, whether design was represented in the corporate hierarchy or not how many c level designers were there uh increased design related investments on their part um it was also you know based on uh, whether the senior management shows deep commitments to design key strategic enabler for innovation and design and design leadership must be present at many senior level now these companies also operationalize design holistically right and the graph that is showing here is 219% increase over snp so this is a direct implication of enabling design within your organization right so let's look at some other examples as well if you go to the next slide which says that the bottom 10 generated a negative cumulative total return of minus 34% and this bottom 10 is snp 500 so these are all fortune 500 companies they generated negative cumulative return of minus 34% but the top 10 customer experience leaders outperformed the snp with close to triple the returns at a cumulative total of plus 43% and this was only possible because of you know design being a strategic initiative uh, by these guys uh there's another example uh, which is again very interesting of um a secret fund called the ux fund right and these guys also started tracking some you know 10 odd companies uh that were in this particular space and they found that these companies are you know design focused and they invested 5000 dollars each in those companies and they did not balance the portfolio or anything they just you know kept quiet after one year they invested about you know 50000 dollars after one year that fund matured to 39.3% and after four years 101.8% now what does this show very clearly is that if design is at the forefront and used as a strategic tool you are definitely going to get much more uh then a non design focused company yeah go to the next slide here are some other examples um from AT&T from user interface engineering from Dell and some of these companies are very famous uh and you can kind of go through that um time reduced for microsoft call center and so on and so forth so it is our uh, conviction that every dollar that is being spent on design yields uh 2 to 100 dollars in return right and if you just spend 10% to gain 83% roi then that is easily justifiable so this is this is kind of uh, really an eye opener that by investing a very small amount in design you your company or your product can gain a lot through this yeah let's go to the next slide Yeah, next one. So, um, companies that embrace design, IBM, for example, right? They invested about hundred million dollars to greatly expand its UX practice. So today, IBM has one of the largest UX or design teams uh, on the planet. Uh, I think they have close to more than two thousand designers now. Um, everyone knows the example of Airbnb. from 2014 to 2017 uh, the airbnb's user experience team grew from 10 to 100 um and different design studios so all of these companies amazon airbnb facebook google apple they are making huge investments in design um and you know apple's uh, example is pretty famous everybody knows steve jobs and tries to emulate um so that that's where you know the importance of design is um let's take this interesting survey and this is for you guys to kind of uh, look to um this is a survey uh of for you to know whether your company is harnessing the value of design so now i will show you some questions uh, on the screen for each question you can score 
a is equal to 1 b is equal to 2 c is equal to 3 write it down on a piece of paper somewhere uh, and then probably you can post your scores later on uh, there will be a, a question about this and then you can post the scores uh, in that particular question the first question is how is your design function organized right do you have a single central department or multiple design teams or design as a distributed exercise or not a department at all so you can choose um, how do you manage the physical and digital divide so do you have you know discrete physical and digital design teams uh, different design functions that operate together or you train your team so that you know they can integrate more effectively where do your design teams work uh, working out of central office uh, sitting at, at different places or cross-functional product plus design plus service kind of studio, right? Uh, the fourth question is, um, <clears throat> the screen is painting for some people, so I'm going to go slow. Uh, does design fit into your development process? And again, there are A, B, and C answers to that. So I'll, I'll pause for a second here uh, till the time you guys read and quickly score. Um, and then we'll go to the next slide. There are, you know, eight more questions like this. Yes. So I'll request all of you to go through these questions and start scoring yourself. A equals to one, B equals to two, and C equals to three. And at the end, you have to accumulate the score. And then we will uh, be also sh um, showing the answers respective to a particular score group. So request you write it down on some paper and then keep on adding the score. That's correct. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. When do you undertake user research? Early qualitative research, qualitative as well as quantitative research, or C is qualitative and quantitative research throughout. So throughout is throughout the process of product development. What do you do with research findings? Do you report them as customers tell you? Do you assess what the customers want? Or do you interpret what the customer actually needs? So there's a difference between what the customers want and need. And when do you prototype? Um, do you have a prototyping phase? Uh, do you have more than one prototyping phase? Or iterate the prototype again and again as needed? And why do you prototype? To check production launch feasibility, to fail fast, or to refine fast? So the difference between failing fast is, you know, you quickly do a, you know, paper sketch or some kind of, uh, you know, prototype and generate new ideas. Uh, when the first idea fails, you go to the next and next and next. Who leads design in your company? Uh, head of department, chief design officer, or a chief design officer who is a peer to other board members. So this particular question is talking about different, at what level is your design um, chief uh, or design organization? Um, can go to the next slide, please. How do you make design decisions? Based on leader opinions, using semi-subjective metrics, or using definitive design metrics, which are very objective. How do you track design performance? Do you at all track? That's A. B is reviewing customer feedback post-launch, and C is we track pre and post-launch as rigorously as we measure quality. Next question is about how do you incentivize good design? So either you don't have any incentive scheme, uh, design shares company level performance bonuses, or you track and reward customer satisfaction even at the board level. And the last question on this slide is, how brave is your organization when it comes to making design decisions? We suffer from a bloated and incremental product portfolio. We have become better at killing in incremental products during product development and we strive to create bold new products to meet unmet needs and accept 
that not uh, at all right so uh, i i hope that you've got all of these and you've written these answers somewhere if you have then we can go to you know what these scores mean just total all the scores that you have a is equal to 1 b is equal to 2 and c is equal to 3 and in a moment i'm going to reveal what what interpretation you should make about uh, these scores right so a survey will come up and you can post your scores later but right now let's look at what these scores really mean okay so if you if you take a look at if you are into the bracket of 0 to 6 it means design isn't considered mission critical for your business or to your customers so these are generally the companies with the most to gain commercially from investing in design especially if their competitors also choose not to use design methods right so very important this point from 6 to 14 um, design has a role in companies in this range but it may not be formally recognized or managed past product successes may seem random and these companies may struggle to articulate what it is their customers desire when developing new offering if you have a score from 14 to 20 then these firms have recognized design capabilities and may see design as a major part of their brand but may not have optimized their structure or processes to exploit design as a commercial resource companies that invest heavily in external design agencies but struggle to deliver the results consistently to market can fall into this particular category and if you are within 20 to 26 excellent you are probably institutionalized already this range includes companies where design is core to the business agenda generally as a business methodology rather than just a branding device these companies are likely to have design literate board members and consider design an asset worth investing heavily in right so uh, you can see how this particular thing progresses and you can post your scores later um, next slide please so some final questions to ponder on before we move on to the next segment can you think of competitors that would have scored higher than you and in which area right so you had all these um, 8 12 different questions in which areas your competitors scored higher or uh, if, if you don't have a design operations at all then what you know your competitors are doing right now you can find that out are your design leaders asking these questions and what would it take to shift your organization further up the ladder uh yeah you could launch the poll for scoring sure um yeah so the poll is now visible on the screen and we hope you would have added up your scores so the different brackets are 0 to 6 6 to 14 14 to 20 and 20 to 26 and we have 30 seconds more to go Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can see the scores moving. Yeah. Yes. So surprisingly, we have thirty-four percent in twenty to twenty-six. Wow. And the last five go here. Yeah, six to fourteen and twenty to twenty-six seem to be. Yeah. Yes. So the, we are done with the polls, and you can see the results on your screen. So we have thirty-three percent in fourteen to twenty, thirty-one percent in twenty to twenty-six, twenty-nine percent in six to forty, and seven percent in zero to six. Over to you. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I'm I'm very impressed by this this scoring. Um, next slide, please. so uh, another uh, thing to really ponder upon and this is really an opportunity for you to really look at things uh, where does your company stand uh, and this is from the nn group uh, I, i hope uh, a lot of you know neil and norman group uh, they have been doing work for the last you know 30 35 years 
and you can look at you know there, there was this survey uh, and when they kind of uh, talk to a lot of companies about the role of design and design ops uh, this is the finding that they had uh, and the highest you can see is some key players or individual teams understand the role and value of design ops which is 41 percent and 39 percent is a role and value of design ops is not well understood so here's a huge opportunity uh, only about uh two percent uh, of these companies uh, have an established design ops culture and know the value of design ops so uh, in the latter half we're going to see what does it mean to operationalize design ops over to you Prasad. yeah yeah thanks samir and um, yeah the survey numbers were very interesting and let's see how we kind of after the second half is done, we can probably look at the same numbers and you know entertain some of the questions, folks, that you would have. So, when do you really need design operations? Uh, typically, what we have heard in our experience so far, and and when we started, we started in the Bay Area, which is the you know, hub of um, design and design thinking. All of you know, and uh, we realized that most of the companies said, "Hey, we need to operationalize design, make it." makes sense to our customers when customers say hey we don't see any value in the product that you're building uh, and number two is teams were struggling because random work happening design requests coming randomly uh, people are working on several uh, you know features and functions and further having a very uh, a strong impact on the bottom line of the company and that's these are two main reasons why design operations was you know kind of got its limelight teams are growing larger these days right because um, you know the whole digitization of products uh, system design service design people are talking about design in every aspect of it and so companies are heavily investing in design now and design teams are growing larger solutions are getting complex uh, the value offerings that uh, you know are all of us are wanting that the customer benefits and the customers and customers are the users benefit uh, we want to give as much as we can so that the user benefits and things are becoming much more complex and hence it's time for us to say hey you know what do i need to kind of give them pile of features and functions or give them something that makes sense to them so that's why design operationalizing design making it make sense uh, matters a lot design teams as you would know they kind of work in bits and pieces probably in pockets different organizations have different ways in which they are organized and their reporting structures are different so they sub end up supporting sometimes the technology group maybe the analytics group and so and so forth so they are probably spread thin in that case again you need to have some sense and make some structure and that's when when you need the design ops well and we all know we are in the age of innovation every every second day we hear hey let's do it in a different way and let's add a new feature or a function or a, or innovate thing so that our product outstands the competitor and be a differentiator that's when again design requests are coming left right and center and that's when we you need the design of sense well uh, tools are getting complex also and a lot more people there are finer nuances of research and design and and uh, the look and feel system design service design all these things design of things as i say has now started gathering a lot of complexity in the organization's uh, uh, vision and things need to kind of be made sense so that you know you don't uh, get overwhelmed and not achieve anything so you need to have a structure of design operations there well and um, in the last four five six years we have seen that design has suddenly got that recognition of the way it needs to be especially in this sub subcontinent and designers are still rare to get the right kind of a designer who would be in the boardroom talk about it be in front of the customer and clearly say this is not what you need this is what you need you know that kind of a value so these kind of great designers are very difficult to find and so you need a very systematic approach to make sure that your design team design department what you say what the message that you give to your customers makes sense and adds value and that's when you need to operationalize or structure uh, your design uh, things 
Well, uh, companies are not centered in one office or one building anymore. As we all know, we are all distributed. Clients are, buildings are distributed. Offices are distributed based on, you know, closeness to the, to the customers and then so and so forth. And so the design team, so the product teams, and so the organization needs to be entertained that way. Uh, well, and the most important part, uh, design is not, okay, we hired a designer and he's going to design uh, year after year. Markets change, complexities change, needs change, and the design of the profession is evolving. What it was 10 years back, as we all know, or maybe even 15 years back, it started with the GUI, graphical user interface, and some icons here and there, and it was never as much as science as we know. But if you dive deep, you realize that now the cognition, it is it, it has an impact of how designers design, keeping the user's cognition in mind, how it should engage the user, how the user should really feel, um, it, you know, having um, uh, developed an efficiency while they're operating the job. Um, is this user interface really effective? Is it learnable and so on and so forth. And that science uh, is what the designers need to also nurture they have to develop themselves. They have to advance their learning by the by the minute based on the market feedback. They need to also be promoted so that they could take care of larger things. They need to be rewarded for what they bring to the table and necessarily give the recognition to the entire thing called design. And that's why we all need design operations. So let's look at this. Uh, so here is a picture. Uh, you have an organization. There are a lot of these team members sitting in different, you know, cubes or maybe tables here, and there are a bunch of these creative guys, and they are kind of sketching and saying, "Hey, this is how we should probably design an interface or a product or, or whatever they are designing." But what if we are talking about a team or a company which is five thousand and ten thousand company? And there could be a sizable 10 to 15 percent, as, as we know popularly, about 10 percent uh, is a good number to have as the design population within such large organizations who are, who are innovating and living technology. So, in order to make these, you know, as you see, two, three guys, and suddenly the team kind of grows over the years to about, you know, 50 or 100, as we saw in some of the examples that Samir shared, scaling matters a lot. And now, when you have to scale, it's not going to be easy, essentially because the workflows, having making sure that these all 50, 100 designers that you have have a common understanding of what the business that we are in, what the technology landscape is, how do we op operate among ourselves to be able to make a timely delivery, yet quality, and not that, okay, I'm doing something else, you are doing something else, the processes are not common, and there's a chaos. Usually when the teams are small, it's easy to manage, but our understanding is in the, in the industry for the last few years that we have been looking at this design operations, usually about a team of seven to eight survives. Thereafter, it, it starts becoming a bit chaotic because these teams start getting distributed to different business units and so on and so forth. Hiring the right talent, essentially, if it is a technology-driven company, becomes a bit of a challenge for the technology head to say, hey, you know what? What is this right kind of a UX talent really means? User experience designer or designer is like what he should or she should be able to deliver, not deliver, focus, uh, push the envelope. I, I don't know. Furthermore, these team members have to be skilled, and they also have a growth path. So all this, if you now start realizing, seems like a department having its own knowledge, having its own structure, starts becoming important, and that's why design operations as a system is important on the management's radar and the organization should take a note of it. As I said, yes, in time and quality is an important aspect. It's not that, hey, uh, we are creative people, so we're going to kind of take time. And I'm sure all of the people who are attending here would be like, I need this solution tomorrow. What is the best way? You know, I can have the best of design uh, in time. And I'm, some, some, I'm sure sometimes we also struggle saying that, hey, I don't have time, do whatever it takes, let's just release the product. And that's what it happens. And it starts killing our own product. Because again, as you remember what Samir had mentioned, that the more time and the more effort that you put on operationalizing design, 
you know, the graph goes up and we remember the 219% uh, in the DMI graph that we saw. The more science, the more thought that you put in design operations, that's the profitability that you're looking at. So thinking long-term, being rested is what the essence of design operation really needs. And of course, aligning teams and departments together. As I said, that design seems to be a kind of then its own, own uh, structure in the organization. And all of this, why are we doing this, right? We are doing this because we want to have a larger impact on the, on the market. We want to be number one, definitely not number two, saying that, hey, we are the best among, among the business, in the business that we are in, among the competitors that are in the, in the market. In that case, you can't just do a, uh, you know, uh, trial and error and maybe this design will work and it will have its impact. No, it has to have its science and a very structured approach. And, and that's why design operations is important. So essentially then when we ask this question, okay, then what does it really mean? Does it mean that, oh, design it in timely and quality, uh, manage the designers? Not really, it's much more broader picture than that. And as you see the three circles here, you're managing the talent who are the creative design thinking folks who are going to talk to the business and really understand what the problem is, translate that into the user interfaces if you're doing a digital product, but if it is a system, then you're thinking of solutions in the physical world and so on and so forth. They are creating something, which is the central, the work output. And um, all of this has to have an impact or an output in the, in the, in the business. Realm. So you have to kind of manage all these three and essentially is all about optimizing. We don't have the luxury of time. And so things have to be optimized. Uh, things have to be standardized. Uh, things have to be predictable. And you don't need to reinvent the wheel again and again, right? So I'm sure some of you who are on the creative side here will say, oh, all these things are going to then shun creativity. But essentially the, the amazing thing about design ops is design ops lets take care of things that are very mundane, predictable, and should be taken care of so that you get necessarily time for design thinking. Give me the space. I don't want to run behind, you know, how to recruit, uh, how to manage my tools, uh, how to, you know, uh, look at uh, time and efficiency. I just need to sit down, look at your client's business problems. That's where the money is. I want to spend time on design thinking. I need to be giving creative solutions that my competitor is not. I need to put in my innovation um, uh, uh, shoes and participate and drive that design and create that impact and the output. And that's where you take care of operationalizing the design things, uh, you will get your time. And that's the essence. This slide is very important. If you want to give the design team to be able to think and put the creative shoes, operationalize all the other stuff, and you will be able to give that quality time to come up with a impact that your customers desire, or you need to bring into the competition. Now, having said that, uh, doesn't mean that uh, it's only to do with designers uh, and and everyone designs, and this should be looked at as a very broad perspective, and then we'll come to a few slides later, uh, where design is a philosophy, it's a mindset and not necessary. Hey, you guys are creative bunch of people, so we'll just apply this. Now, design operations is across the company where everyone is onboarded on the fact that, hey, it's a mindset change and let's let it percolate through the organization horizontally. Well, there are different elements and um, the list could go 50 and 100, but I'm going to talk about few circles here that matter that matters the most. And then there are further uh, uh, splits to it as well. Um, so roles and responsibilities, just take a look, sit for a while and say, oh, okay, you know what, I have a design team. And uh, what should be the roles and responsibilities? And what should be the hierarchy? Okay, it's a thought that someone has to put in place. Who puts that thought in place in your organizations? Uh, if design has to be operationalized in a big way. Um, alignment, how should they be operating? Should they be operating in a, you know, the product alignment, project alignment, department alignment? We don't know. And what really makes, makes profit for the company or makes most efficient sense? 
uh, talent acquisition. I know there are people who call UX designers. I can just hire them. But am I really doing a great job of making sure that this is it? This is the talent I need or this is not the talent I need. Is, and there is a, quite a bit of science. There is a design test that you give and, and so on and so forth. So it has its science on its own. Then the growth path, as I said that, yeah, designers, you need to kind of provide them with the growth path. And uh, training and coaching, because every day the market is changing. Today, we all talk about AI. We talk about machine learning. Uh, we talk about analytics. We talk about robotics, uh, for voice interface, zero interface, and whatnot. Uh, yes, designers, as they grow, they need to be trained and coached as well. Uh, and scoping, so all of us know that on the table, there's a request. Suddenly, I kind of respond, and have I even thought about the scope? I keep designing, and and it kind of you know. Uh, typically, we realize that there are these opportunities where, uh, or situations where, oh, I I needed it yesterday. Oh, the design is still not done. Oh, because I am not, I don't have the clarity as to what is required. So all that chaos is what I want to tell you through these circles here, and 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 so on and so forth. So standardization, tracking of work done. Now imagine if you have 50 or 100 people design team, how are you going to track? And you would need standardization so that predictability is high. And then resourcing, does this project need one resource, two talent, three talent? When do you need research? When do you not need research? And so on and so forth. And so these circles keep growing. And I'm sure when you think about it a little more critically, you will realize that your circles would probably go beyond this, and that's absolutely okay. Um, because if you notice, um, some circles on the far left-hand side of the screen is talking about the work, the methodology, and the science of design. Uh, the top circles will tell you a story about, um, hey, people are important, and we need to train them, and you know, look at the hiring and the growth path and all of that stuff. And the extreme right-hand side talks about the scoping of stuff or project management or design management because that's where efficiency is so on one side we have the creative process and you know design thinking but at the same time i have to make sure that my organization is most efficient and i know there are a few ceos who have joined in this uh, in the audience and, and would be very curious to see some of the questions at the end uh, but that's what matters and hence if you want to operationalize things have a goal very important to have a goal and then you will realize maybe some of these circles does not matter as my let's say an mvp way of looking at design operations for the next quarter i'm just going to look at maybe uh, coming up with standards so that predictability high uh, i will probably put in some science and a mechanism to scope things better so that you know it's predictable and my design is efficient uh, with the impact um so here's an example uh, this is how the nielsen norman group looks at it they say hey you know what there are three buckets um, how we work together all things that could tell how we work how we should work together or how we could work together comes in one bracket or one one box second is how do we get our work done so principles and methodology and processes and so on and so forth and the third one is hey we need to measure it right because Though it's a creative process, it has to earn money for the customers or for, for, for the company. Um, here's another example. Uh, so same set of circles, maybe more, maybe some of them are not there, but someone else has looked at it in a different manner. They're saying, okay, no, all operational things, I'll bucket it in one. Project management is another important aspect, and uh, process of things is another bucket. Communication is very important in my organization or my business. And so the communication related stuff has been kind of bucketed together. So design operations, there's no black and white. As far as you look at the goal, look at all the elements that matter to your design operations, chart them down, prioritize them, and attack. So how do you go about essentially doing that? Uh, most of you who are um, aware of user experience design or the process of the methodology of informing design, research is always the beginning. So go ahead and research, listen and gather data from the key stakeholders, especially the CEOs and the board of directors, saying that, hey, where are we taking the shift in? And where, where are we in the realm of design and its impact in the market? And what do you think should be the philosophy with which we should operationalize design? That is a good starting point. 
Uh, in this, you could also take a journey by talking to the CTOs and the product management heads and all those guys who are critically holding all the critical pieces of the company because the design is going to cut talk about all of these guys and you will be collaborating with all of these guys. Um, so share the pain points. Once you have done your research, share the pain points. Um, illustrate the possible impact that design operations is going to have if it comes into being, if it is already not. If it is there in bits and pieces, then you will have to jot down the points as to, hey, how design operations can be matured to be able to able to have the impact in the boardroom. Sometimes they also talk about, hey, you know what? You need uh, people to stand by design operations because it's not that, hey, it's a separate department and then you will be able to make an impact. You have to really evangelize and have all these stakeholders back you up because a better design thinking, a design process has an impact in their success also. If design is in place, product delivery is much more efficient. And if you could connect that, you will find advocates standing by your side to have that kind of a, um, you know, impact in getting design operationalized. So I had briefly touched upon this and I want to Retread this off because there are clearly two aspects that matter the most. So one is the mindset. First of all, the entire organization should have that mindset of design-driven value, and hence the entire ecosystem. It's just not one aspect. It's not a function of marketing. It's not the function of um, you know the UI designers as we feel they are designers. Uh, 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 and the responsibility doesn't just lie with them to make things usable and the users are going to say, wow, this product is great. No, the, it has to cut across the entire organization. So everyone has to think of that mindset right from the CEO till the, the person who I joined yesterday in our organization to think design as operations or design thinking mindset so that everything is looked at from standards, process, methodology point of view, tools that we use, all in all for that imp important aspect of whatever am i doing in terms of design is it effective and is it efficient at the same time the other aspect is the way you execute this mindset and usually that's where design operations as a as a bunch of people or a department comes into being or if it is already existing as a design department then you have to basically arrive at this process of operationalizing it in a way that makes it effective, predictable, optimized, so that the design thinking, as I said earlier, of the creativity that it needs gets its time. And hence, essentially, it is about empowering the design, the designers, and the design thinking philosophy in your organization. By doing this, essentially, what you also get is um, uh, a champion a champion kind of an energy who will always talk about design because the rest of the departments like marketing will have their marketing vision and marketing talk. Uh, to talk about technology will have their technology innovations to talk about. So someone has to take up design. And as you see here, there are these different departments, right? There's an engineering group and then there's QA and then there is maybe security because that's the nature of the business that you're in. And then there's the design department and they are taking care of all these aspects and there are a bunch of folks probably who are nurturing design and operationalizing design fundamentals so that the entire organization is aware of design as a streamlined function sometimes in some of the org organizations you'll realize that design operations need to be going hand in hand with product management maybe because you have two or three products uh, that you're running and each product has its own essence own research that you need own um, structure that it needs because of the complexities then we'll have two different um, you know, teams driving the design operations maybe they might collaborate intermittently for larger knowledge and truth but most sometimes this is another structure the other structure would be one single department everyone comes and goes borrows talents from them but essentially it's a centralized repository of knowledge practice uh, which stands like a strong pillar in the middle of the organization and everyone could go and benefit from it. So that's another structure here. Well, yes, uh, 
we are we innovate we ideate we you know bring in more functions and features and ideas as we go and hence the philosophy of sprints came into being and usually yes they say that you know we are one or two ahead uh, two sprints ahead of our requirements and usually the requirements kind of percolate um, you know from the business that hey this is what the customer is needing so we kind of put some specs together throw it over the wall the development team kind of puts this you know the sprints together and then we wait and see whether it is going to work or not or oh, come back redesign put it in this in, in the sprints but the philosophy of the operationalizing design if you operationalize design essentially gives you that structure thing that okay let's talk about the function let's talk about the need that the businesses would have six months in advance so you you have a dedicated team which is already thinking forward so that you are not reactive to the market needs but very very proactive saying that hey not we have thinkers we have designers who would collaborate with the business collaborate with the clients and operationalize even innovation and i think that's the beauty that uh, design operations bring to this brings to the uh, table uh, because now it's more um, structured and not haphazard and reactive that's the beautiful thing and as you see at the bottom these are some of the companies uh, which has been extremely successful in implementing this not doing a hurried job not doing a reactive job two things how you can actually get it done uh, what we have noticed in our experience is some of the companies would come and say hey you guys are the experts in the industry so why don't you come and guide us uh, here is our team this is our structure please you know investigate do the research that you need help us build uh, this this science uh, of operationalizing design and then we build it we operationalize it and then it, we transfer it to them and in some cases we started with a design team of 5 to 10 today they are 60 and they are they are on their own second option is you get a champion uh, who's been there done that and embed him or her into your culture and let them quickly operationalize design second option bit difficult because uh, you know for the person to understand your culture uh, be there you might burn some uh, uh, months there so essentially but these are the two uh, you know big ways in with which you can move forward on operationalizing design so well in conclusion just to summarize whatever we saw today essentially business uh, have to invest in design operations to be able to give that accountability um, and stand by hey design drives businesses so there has to be someone who takes up the accountability design would enable predictability i know what i'm going to design next quarter versus i don't know something has come up let me just quickly scramble people together and design so predictability is important and then build that credibility in the market as you saw some big names in the in, in the previous first half of the presentation an opportunity to build credibility and credibility again as i said doesn't come by reactive ways but very sensible proactive uh, rested approach a structured approach of looking at design as a starting point and not as a reaction point optimizing processes and measuring the support designers so that they could focus on consistent quality output while you deliver value it also has to have its impact at scale it should not be oh two bunch of guys are very creative they are adding value to a product uh, rest of the people i don't know what they're doing in them for example you know these are the conversations that they've been hearing so that should not happen the entire perception that design operations in our company is 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 great uh, it's not run in pockets. Uh, well, uh, we have already seen this. It's one common thread that enables us to weave things together, how we work, how the work is getting done, and the impact of the work that we do can be told as an amazing story in the boardroom or in the, you know, when you're making uh, a pitch to the customer. A very strong upward curve is what we have seen wherever all the companies have implemented design operations. Of course, it's right, right? Imagine 10, 50, 20, 30 guys 
just randomly in the organizations um, reacting to design requests versus a, a very well loyal predictable design group led by a champion with set of other champions well structured attacking different aspects of your product or your customer needs definitely it's obvious by just listening to this you will realize that the bottom line would be really showing up uh, complexities at any given point of time you would be knowing hey who's working on what what is the um, uh, uh, completion level of a particular design versus the other and also predict it as i said a uh, very matured feel to the entire organization right uh, imagine uh, you're, you're talking to certain delegates who visit you or you have to make a presentation and someone talks about design or a particular function that you're designing and you say, oh, you know what, I don't know, let me go and check who's doing that design versus a very mature understanding of an overall um, aspect of where are we uh, on delivery of a particular function. Uh, decision making is faster because visibility is there. Uh, if you have the visibility only then you can make stronger and faster decisions um, so that's another critical benefit of design operations and then um, of course as we said consistent processes um, efficiency in output so predictability is high and then good collaboration with all the team members uh, as i said across the organization you're cutting uh, horizontally and uh, build your credibility yeah, so that brings to the end. I'll take a pause here and then um, Amandi, we could probably see if uh, people have questions and we could answer them. Thanks, Prasad. Thanks, Samir. We hope we had a lot of useful insights. And now we have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. We would like to hear your view on design ops and would like your inputs on what are the top areas you would like to address through design ops. So before we start to take question and answer, we are posting this question sure. on your screen. The question is visible on your screen, which is what are the top areas you would like to address through design ops? So you can start posting your queries. And also, what are the top areas that you think? It could be random as well. So meanwhile, we will start taking the questions. Yeah. So our first question here is, how should the design sprints be planned in sync with the development? Or how should we design function as part of a typical agile team? Yeah, so as I had said, uh, design is always proactive uh, they are never, never reactive that we mostly see uh, in most of the organizations because technology drives design is the philosophy um, but here the philosophies are the way around where design thinking understanding the business needs customer needs challenges users how they expect the world to be in the future is a very proactive approach for designers so designers have to be always one step i would rather say five step ahead in any any company or any contribution and so understand those needs get a good buying from the businesses and then develop the, the designs then you're invariably way ahead in terms of sprints and then what you'd essentially do is um, uh, demonstrate the product value through the technology team which would then pick it up and then develop it so you're way too ahead when you're adding that um, value to the organization well, if you're struggling with that today, go take a pause, talk to the product development um, uh, team or the department or the head and trigger that conversation that, hey, let's talk about what your roadmap is over the next you know, two months or three months or the next quarter. Let me start attacking that right now versus we come to that 
maybe in the month of october when you have to release the product on 15th of october that's reactive so the, those are my two cents and, and maybe i'll take a pause and see what samir has to add so i think uh, if you can put up that slide prasad again uh, of the try track uh, agile right so sure. typically uh, you know typically in organizations who have been practicing agile there is double track or two track agile process that is being run and the two tracks are uh, basically the design and development and design is always uh, n plus 1 or n plus 2 that is one or two sprints ahead uh, but what is happening in a typical agile model is that design only delivers the current requirements and the backlog requirements but there is no scope there for innovation or understanding or discovery from users and therefore this new latest model that has come up is where the design is much more ahead in terms of sprints it is not n plus 2 it is as prasad was saying n plus 5 and the first step that is taken is of research or understanding the users their needs their mental models and then you know the discovery and delivery phases really happen so uh, while you are you know using your regular agile to go two sprints ahead test and again you know get the product designs out you are also looking at some future product releases and you are gathering data for future product releases and therefore this particular model and it has been proven as you can see from the names at the bottom that it is proving really effective in alignment of customer and user requirements and directly into their product otherwise these cycles used to take a long time with the you know, combination of you know agile this pre track really works very well i hope that uh, answered your question yes the next question that we have here is when you are working on a new product where no prior customer requirements on design do we entirely give the hold in hands of the designers to create the ux and ui or do you think the project managers can pitch their thoughts to yeah well uh, this is interesting perspective uh, i think designers are collaborators that's that's the the mindset um, they usually carry uh, it's a very false notion in the market um, and we need to kind of quickly get over that that oh you are the designer so you are the creative person so whatever you would have done would be good or oh i am the designer and what i think i have designed is going to work for the users now uh, A, a good designer is always empathetic towards everyone needs right from you know the ceo of the company because he is talking about or predicting about certain things for the for his own company or if he is entertaining the customer uh, the product manager uh, the end users everyone has their needs and expectations designers are curious beings who are just lying extremely low observe and understand these needs take them synthesize them and then come out with a design which will help these of course the journey should also be to validate if the needs are true and not just um, you know design for everything that comes across but that's essentially the designer's role so to answer your question uh, when you are working on a new product where there are no prior customer requirements essentially then if there are no requirements uh then what are you designing but if there is an innovation go back to the users uh understand if the users are really expecting it and um, and then design for it otherwise yes i could be creative enough i don't have any customer requirements and i can design a phone with both the sides that have touch screen wow what an innovation but does the user really want it it's a question is a, it's a good question to ask and rather than go and uh, talk to the users and really see dive deeper and see if there are opportunities on innovation and usually my experience has been if you dive really deeper into the users mental model amazing insights that you get for innovation
next yeah, question the next question. Here is, yes, it's regarding, are there any standardization on the outbox time boxing as a result of the design phase? So I assume that the question is about, um, you know, how do you, how do you time box uh, your deliverables for design? Um, hmm. And it's an interesting question, I would say. Uh, so definitely design as an entire cycle can work within six weeks or it can also take six months. So it, the answer is uh, typically it depends, right? And it depends on the complexity of the project and product. Uh, as a thumb rule, you can say uh, between, so the total investment of, uh, in terms of efforts or, or the money, I would say is between 10 to 20% of your total products uh, uh, investment. Um, so let's say if you're investing 100 rupees in total, uh, then 20 rupees should be invested to design. Uh, but the proportion of time that design takes should be about 30, between 30 and 40% uh, of the total, uh, with initial engagement of design being very high. Uh, and then it tapers towards the end as, uh, you know, the product goes out in the market. Yeah. So if you, I think, uh, yeah, if you take some initial efforts of um, getting your head around the needs, then I think predicting time becomes easy and then you can have a pretty good ballpark and a control over it because that's what design operations enables you to or the methodology of informed design enables you to do uh, is not um, uh, someone coming to your desk and say, hey, you know, let's put a homepage together. You start putting the homepage together, we'll come back with you, back to you with requirements or and so on and so forth with any, any uh, you know, designs that you're creating. So yes, uh, take a step back, understand you would be able to predict. And that's a, I think that's a good sign of uh, a, a designer who has a structured mindset towards attending the work. Uh, however, cre creative it is, um, it has a has has an outer limit that can be predicted. Yeah. Yes. The next question that we have here is: um, Can we possibly have a designer UX and UI all in just one breed of a resource? Can you yeah, have, can I, you I, have I, I would have love to hear um, his response to this and, question. Uh, you know, database administrator and a UI guy in one person, full stack, right? So there's there's been talk about this full stack designer as well. Uh, there are some skills that you can combine. So for example, in at US Design, definitely we have UX designers who also do user research and a bit of UI. Uh, we also have UI visual designers who also do user research and some UX, but that, that's the extent of it. They will not be able to go beyond that and do HTML. Um, because if you want to really make an impact, either UX or through visual design or through research, there, there are you know some nuances of that particular skill that you need to acquire, uh, which is a very specialized and focused skill set. So at a surface level, maybe you can do a fair job in both, uh, but not a very big impact in both. So you will really have to uh, go towards one or the other skill. Um, difficult to find, but there are UX, UI, hybrid designers. Yeah, yeah so, so look at it, right? If you, if you see this, um, and if you read the question again, you realize that this is the question coming essentially saying that, hey, you know what? I need something tomorrow. Let me put something together. If I have one person who could do both, it's like having both the gas stoves on. On one, you're cooking biryani. On another, you're cooking pulao. And one person trying to do both. Um, high possibility that you might complete both on time. But we can talk about what could be the customer's feedback on how it tastes. Uh, because you are, we have, you know, given attention. You splitted your attention into two. The other example could be essentially cascading effect. I'm doing the design thinking part, and then I'm going to do the UI hands-on part. How do you divide this? Um, so if I'm doing a lot of thinking and designing, after that only I'm going to start the UI design. But in the real realm. I'm a UX designer, for example, and I'm going to do some design thoughts. I'm going to delegate certain pieces for UI design. 
So it's cascading. So the productivity and the efficiency is much more higher and quickly check what's happening uh, in a give and take fashion. And so essentially I would say rule it out um, that one person could do both. Uh, it's it's uh, essentially very short term and reactive and may not go in the long term. So quick fixes, maybe you could consider those, but not otherwise. Yes, so follow up question we have here. What qualities we should look for when we are identifying the resources for the design team? If you can just summarize those. Wow. I think uh, it needs a, a dedicated hour uh, because it's, it's, it's really challenging to find the needle in the haystack. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's very, uh, uh, very qualitative research uh, that we typically take when we are interviewing the candidates um, and and talk about what they bring to the table uh, but so one of the critical and the most critical um, thing that we have realized designers need to bring to the table is to be able to ask questions uh, question the status quo and um, and and bring something to the table which can be rationalized so there has to be strong reason why i feel this design is going to have that kind of an impact on business. So these are the three things that came to my mind. And um, uh, I'm sure Samir would like to add to that, uh, which is also very critical. Yeah, the first uh, first and foremost you should look at is uh, a skill, uh, of course, justifying the design that people have made. Uh, and the designer should be able to defend their design uh, and not because he or she has a design education or is a designer by trade, but because there is a connection with user need, business need, and therefore this design. So if you want to look at just one quality, informed design is what I would say. Uh, whether that person knows informed design, what is it, and how could he do that? That's, that's the quality you should look for. Um, the next query that we have here is a follow-up of the try track agile so do you have any specific pointers towards integrating it across the various team in an organization as each team can have a different agile cycle yeah i mean uh, <laughs> some of the pointers would be you can divide your agile teams uh, basically uh, you know you have these days you have squads right and these squads are actually divided as per a different set of products or business units. Uh, you can do Star Trek Agile the same way. Yeah, you can divide it vertically, either business unit wise or you know different product suite wise, so that the understanding phase that happens, the research, can happen for a bunch of similar products together. And therefore, yeah, you know, you don't have to kind of repeat the same things again and again. Uh, and the larger research that should happen is about what are the user and customer requirements from their perspective, not only from a product manager's perspective, and uh, you know how they are translated then into the user stories. Okay, so uh, creating the personas, you know, creating all those things, uh, the artifacts for user research is is kind of extremely important. But if you can take you know a similar based four or five products together and club the understanding or user research phase that could reduce your cost uh, to a larger okay the next query that we have here is um, usually the ux and ui proposal given by the designer gets approved but what if in terms of development there are too many hurdles which does not make the product up to the mark as proposed. What are the few steps here? So uh, in our methodology and our process at use designs, when we work with uh, different customers, the first step along, along with uh, stakeholder and user research is a technological handshake. So right at the beginning of uh, the project, uh, our CTO um, and we go and meet the uh, other uh, other companies CTO and their technological team and see what are the constraints or if there are any constraints that they have with respect to creating the design 
and implementing the design right and this kind of solves a lot of problem because they also get um, quite a um, uh, lot of time actually to look through the design and we insist that one member from the technology team should be part of the design review team who can then voice out any concerns if they have regarding the technological constraints this will avoid any rework uh, post the design that we have yes the next query that we have here is regarding the setting up of the team so when do you think is the right time an organization should consider setting up a design ops team so i think design ops is more of a philosophy and uh, yes as um, the team grows you may need some dedicated effort uh, it may not be so for example let's imagine your five or 10 member team so essentially as far as you have that mindset as we spoke earlier all these guys could pick up certain pieces which are critical and and remember those gray circles that i had kind of popped up in the screen you can start picking up some of those based on the goals and and the and the vision that the company has uh, eventually imagine that you become a 50 member team then maybe there could be a team of let's say two or three guys who probably dedicatedly pick up some of these pieces and own it up and drive it so again there is no hard and fast rule that hey you need to have a dedicated resource who just do operations and processes and methodology and come out with uh, you know philosophies of the you know the growth path or roads and responsibilities and don't need to you don't need to give it an administrative department of design uh, that's not the, the goal the goal is essentially as team members of the entire design uh, department if you will call it have this philosophy that all these pieces matter to us and how do we make them optimized continuously of course the champion of that department or, or the design group could lay certain foundation to be able to operationalize design operation philosophy within that group as to who could do what and make sure that it is always operated uh, are, are my two cents yeah thanks prasad the next question is in relevance to the product marketing so can you share some example of how design ops can play a part in product marketing? Hmm. Well, uh, we had had several examples uh, because um, uh, marketing is always in the forefront and they usually get both um, what, the, what the market pulse really is when they go out and, and market the product. Let's imagine that you're a product company uh, the marketing team would be telling array you know in the market this is what is happening and the competition is doing this and we don't have that and we don't have this uh, or let's have do this uh, new innovation or this idea so usually the marketing team would be getting us the pulse um take it with a pinch of salt uh because uh, they 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 wouldn't have done the deeper dive that typically the design group would do to be able to really understand what the user's needs are and not the wants. Wants would definitely come from the marketing team. Hey, you know what? User wants this, and user wants a, you know, an ice cream and a lollipop and what not. But when we actually ask the users, they will say, hey, you know what? I want to feel satisfied after using a particular product, and not necessarily an ice cream will make me happy. So when the user, when the designers do that, uh, they will come up with much more richer insights, which you can then feed back to the marketing team team, and then say, you know what? This is the USP. Uh, which we have rationalized and would be working in the markets go and and market it and um, you know we should we should see some benefit out of that market so that's how i see it happening the next question we have here is more of a kind of a role or design ops professional has so it's a very generic question um, do you think the design ops is a designer or is it more of a product management professional? I would say neither, or it could be either. What we need is almost like a program manager who understands design, who understands a bit of technology, and who understands project management because and business, of course, because there is a touch point to all of these different departments 
so we need probably a you know holistic person um who knows you know what talent to hire uh how to write maybe the roles and responsibilities and gds who also knows you know estimation of projects uh who can you know uh, tell the designers to manage the project within you know time and budget also negotiate with management to get more budget right so it's it's kind of a, a holistic personality uh, i would say it's a program manager um, most companies i don't know very large companies do have a program manager it's that kind of a role that kind of a person that we're looking at yes um so this go this is more regarding to the concept so the concept is not when it comes to design ops it is not a new concept altogether it has been uh, in picture since last two or three years and it has been much more talked about so what is the reason it is so much talked about so i guess a, a simple answer that comes to my mind um, again i'll go back to cooking right cooking everyone knows cooking but now when it comes to healthy cooking we need to go back and learn that science again so our own things that we are proud of that here yeah, cooking it's a household thing in india and yeah everyone knows it but we have it's a lost art unfortunately and when we look at the healthy cooking or you know what are well cooked food and vitamins and all that we have to learn that science all over again so that's where we are so we reacted when the technology came in in 1990s we said how oh, we are creative let's engineer code things and make things available to the users and in that uh, we realized that it became a lot more chaotic so we had to kind of go back and say okay now let's put some healthy concept in the in, in the in, into the product which will make uh, make the users life uh, easy and also give us the the money uh, and not other way around where we have a lot of features and functions everything that is possible on the earth inside the product but these users are just um, shying away from using your product so that's that, that those are my two cents and that's why it's yes it's a old concept but never given it the way it needs to be um, practiced yes the next question is more about the remote design collaboration so um, how do you see it um, when it comes to remote design collaboration um, it is increasing in many organizations at the same time definitely very complicating factor to consider so how does um, preparing for it and improving remote design collaboration uh, could play a role in design ops as you may see it mm -hmm. yeah so uh, um yes yeah, yeah. go ahead yeah. yeah i was talking about um, you know taking baby steps um you know uh, try a project or two uh, have someone in maybe um maybe imagine you're a product manager or a design manager or you're just a designer who's sitting in x place uh have someone else who's in a remote location maybe in a different time zone uh, and and play it out saying that hey okay we are here and we are designing this particular um, module or whatever you are it is on your product or maybe it's an innovation project we are doing um you know maybe a mobile app for our company so that's collaborate and we might have a Uh, designers and researchers and what not spread across the globe give it a shot and you'll realize that there is there is a system that you need to put in place and not just keep talking and talking and talking and get the designs done and because you will have to replicate this model in all the places so start small observe steps that you need that you are taking and you need to take in order to make this particular product successful because that's your initiative that you've taken and so you want to make it successful right so you're not going to go all over the place and just scramble for ideas and put designs together and and shout over the call saying that are you sir need design karna aisa karna and so and so forth you'll realize it's a very structured approach that you need to put in place um but yeah that reminds me of how uh, we dealt with design um where uh, you know some of us were in san francisco one of us was in bangalore and someone was in pune and uh, and and the, cu the customer's main product manager was sitting in uk how do you get it done um so you will realize it can't be just get to the battlefield and start fighting it has to have a strategy you could think about it and put it in place but uh, i'll have also samira to be able to say something so i would say it's the other way around the design ops 
plays a very important and critical role when you are collaborating remotely for design. Uh, designers are very, you know, tactile, right? So they have to be in the same room, brainstorming, doodling, and you know, uh, sharing ideas with each other. Now with this remote, it's become difficult for them to actually do this particular collaboration. And therefore, a well-established design of system would actually help any remote collaboration work much more better by giving them very clear guidelines on what is the estimation, how much time should be spent, what is the budget that they have, uh, how many meetings one should attend, uh, the output that needs to come out in a, in a timely fashion, all of those things, right, which is part of design art. So if that system is established somewhere, it will definitely help uh, remote design collaboration much more. And it is the need of the hour right now. Design ops is the need of the hour uh, because design is getting much more important. Design teams are scaling so much. And even if you have a very small team, the output and outcome of design is directly uh, impacting your product or service and the outcome of whether you will retain customers or not. And therefore, even if you have a very small team, even less than 10, design ops is very critical because the cost of design is increasing day by day. If you look at you know, the demand and supply around in the market, uh, there is a lot of demand with less supply of good designers. And therefore, to uh, manage the cost, design ops is going to be extremely important and more so in a remote environment. Yes. Um, the last question that we have in the interest of time. Uh, when you're at a stage of starting a design thinking process in your organization, that is a, definitely in the organization that is planning to do so, but somewhere you get lost in some part. So which path is better? To get a consultation to boost your team and culture or hiring someone for the same? Yeah, so it seems that you have already lost some time um, and you got started, but then you realize that it's not working. So it looks like time is of essence. Um, getting someone would mean there's another level of risk uh, where you're realizing that, okay, maybe that will work. So best way is to get an expert, get get the ground um, you know, foundation in place, uh, learn the trade um, of how this could be done and, and then take it forward from there is what I would say. Okay. okay, thank you so much, Prasad and Samir. Any final thoughts you would like to add here before we conclude? Well, we would like to know how did this session go. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't have hundreds of videos on and, and talk real time, uh, which was most desired, but um, would love to hear um, uh, more questions. I'm sure there would be more questions. So send us those uh, yes. questions offline, maybe through this chat to Amandeep. Thanks, Amandeep, if you could help us with that. And also let us know yes. uh, how did this session go and specific things that you would like to, us to cover in our next session. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so and, much, uh, Prasad and one, one sentence. Yeah, one sentence mm -hmm. I would like to say here is that whether large or small, design team or no design team, design ops is extremely important. So start today, start now. Thank you, Amandi. Yeah. Yes, yes. Design is like a valuable DNA. We do agree with that. And um, if your questions couldn't be answered in the interest of time, please feel free to get in touch with us at pune at nascom.in and our team will get in touch with you. We hope today's session was informative and you have a lot of useful insights. And if you want to connect offline with the speakers or you want to get in touch for the recording, uh, again, please feel free to get in touch at pune at nascom .in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Prasad and Samir. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.